Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, uh, Kathy Stuck sends her regrets that she couldn't make it. Um, uh, one of uh, the challenges of a department secretary is uh, their schedule. And uh, Kathy's schedule is uh, much in demand and changes uh, hourly, actually. Uh, and uh, I would imagine that what she uh, had planned for today didn't actually occur as she was doing the other things. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, she shows her regrets for not being able to be here, uh, but hopefully uh, I can stand in for her and um, uh, make a, a valuable presentation for you. Um, before I get started with my presentation, I do want to talk about um, a little bit about the water division, so that sort of puts in context my perspective. And um, uh, we feel in the water division that we have lots to do with economic development. Uh, we have, um, uh, of course, our perspective is water quality. Um, our charge is to uh, provide uh, clean uh, water for recreation, for drinking, for fish. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we take that seriously. On the other hand, uh, we also um, have to use this. We have to use our resources. And um, without good, healthy economy, we can't protect our water either. So uh, we only realize that, and uh, that's the perspective we try to bring. Um, the Water Division has four bureaus, or four programs. One is fish, um, and uh, of course, we, fish does everything from hatcheries, uh, rearing of fish, to stocking, surveys of fish health. Um, uh, a couple of things we're trying to, uh, to do is um, uh, simplify the, the angle of the regulations. Um, if you are uh, in Wisconsin, you'll know that uh, they can be very complex, and, and we're trying to find a way to simplify it. Um, and uh, that's something that we've heard uh, needs to be done, and we're attempting to do that. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds, uh, but that is uh, something that we have. Uh, you may have also heard of our, our walleye initiative that was uh, in the last budget, and uh, we are um, actively pursuing that to become the walleye capital of the country, if not the world. So that's, that's our goal, and we are engaging the private sector to do that as well. Our drinking water and groundwater bureau, of course, uh, works primarily in public and private drinking water sources, making sure that we have good standards and good construction and the wells are built properly, things like that. Uh, but they also deal with water quantity issues for the Great Lakes Compact. They administer that for the state. And, um, and so here in Mantua, we're fully within the Great Lakes Basin, uh, but uh, there are communities, um, Wakatra comes to mind, this sort of half in, half out, uh, and they have uh, uh, radium problems with their drinking water and, and looking to make Michigan to be, uh, maybe uh, help resolve some of that uh, for the drinking water sources, but it isn't that simple anymore just to take the water out of it. Michigan, um, and make sure you turn it, and we show through the contact. So we're dealing with that. We also have a Water Quality Bureau. Uh, they deal with the Clean Water Act permits for municipal wastewater, for industrial processes. Um, they evaluate and establish uh, the, uh, the impaired waters list, which is required by the Clean Water Act, and also develop total maximum daily loads, which are basically plans to identify where pollutants are coming from in the impaired water and allocating amongst the various sources uh, what, how much pollutant can come from them and, and have the water actually meet its goals. Uh, they also establish water quality standards in that bureau. And finally, probably the most controversial bureau, if we didn't have enough controversy with the first three, is our Watershed Management Bureau. They do people permitting, the large farms, uh, that are controversial wherever they, um, they come up. Uh, they do stormwater permitting for industrial processes, municipal stormwaters, uh, um, as well, for example, has to be a municipal stormwater permit, construction sites. <coughs> uh, but they also do wetlands and shoreland zoning, which uh, I'll be getting into detail on, on my talk, uh, as well as in-water activities, uh, dredging processes, piers, and other non-contributional issues, uh, rip-wrap projects, those types of things. <laughs> so, um, um, but one thing I do want to emphasize, and, and I'll be talking about this through our, through our talk, is we really are trying to move our culture of DNR 
from one of, no, you can't do that, we're protecting the resource, uh, to one of problem solving to get to yes. And are there ways that we can work together and, and meet in the middle and find ways that we can protect our resources but also encourage and provide for economic development? We really are sincerely trying to do that. So uh, with that sort of backdrop, I'll uh, get into my presentation. First, that the uh, Wisconsin Shoreland Protection Program, or Shoreland Zoning, as it's commonly known. And this has been a very controversial um, issue for many years. And uh, as we'll get into it, we had um, a revision process that took place from 2000, year 2000 to 2010. It took us 10 years to get through this. Multiple, multiple iterations through, um, through uh, Shoreland Zoning proposals. Shoreland Zoning was first started in um, the 1960s, and in fact, the first rule was 1970, and that had been in place until 2010 revisions. And um, during the 2010 revisions, the, uh, uh, as, once they came out, uh, and you say, well, after 10 years, couldn't get it right? Well, no, because nothing until you get it out there and people start really looking at it. Um, it, it really doesn't. Um, uh, some of the problems don't really come out, but counties who have to implement this uh, saw that, hey, there's some issues here, and uh, some things that we could make, we could make better. So um, they, we've been meeting with them for the last couple of years, and uh, came up with some proposed changes. And those revisions are to our impervious surface limits, and I'll kind of go through what those are, uh, our non-conforming structure standards, um, a, a minor change to vegetative management and, and, and a change to reporting. So um, the impervious surface standards, um, the original 2010 rule had so that you had to apply them within 300 feet of the ordinary high water mark of a, a river, a stream, or a lake. And what that, had, what, what that provided is the usual lack because um, the, the standard in another place since the 1960s has been for an unsewered lot, you have to uh, have a minimum of 20,000 square feet. And traditionally, that has been 100 feet of frontage, 200 feet back. So, um, so you've got 100 feet of frontage, 200 feet back. Then, then usually, you got a road. So you got 66 feet of access to the road. So now you have 266 feet. So now you've got the next lot and you've got 33 feet of it. So what do you do with that? And how do you apply standards to the first 33 feet and say that lot is another 200 foot lot when you do the rest of it? So that, that created a lot of confusion that we thought we could rectify without really uh, affecting the impact of the rule. So what we, the, the, the change the revision that we're proposing uh, is to uh, uh, just use riparian lots, lots that are directly adjacent to the ordinary water more, uh, or lots that are fully within the 300 feet zone. So you're dealing with whole lots. And so that's going to provide some, uh, uh, eliminate the application to portions of lots and, and provide a, a easier implementation. Um, also, and this was a, a big deal, um, we looked at, we had this impervious surface, and I'll go through the, the percentages, etc. cetera. Um, and but we didn't really address a, a kind of a performance standard issue. Um, so if you take your impervious surface and you treat it, you basically run that, the, the runoff off of that surface to an area where it's going to infiltrate into the ground or into a rain garden or into, uh, say, a drainage swale of some sort. Um, if our concern is water quality and the water kind of draining into the receiving water carrying all these pollutants, and we can design it so it doesn't do that, why should we create a, an artificial impediment for somebody to do what, what they want on their property? So we, we have a, a, a provision in the revisions that would um, allow that if you're draining the, uh, uh, or treating the water uh, prior to uh, it hitting the, the uh, receiving water, you don't have to count it when you put the surface lines. It takes it up. So for example, you got a driveway, you put it in your driveway, and you've got, say, um, some drainage swales along the, the bio swales along the side. It looks to you and me like a nice little flower garden along the side that actually serves to catch the rainwater and, um, and infiltrate it into the ground. You don't need an engineer necessarily to plan it for you. You can do it yourself. 
um, and you don't have to pump your driveway to improve the service for So, um, so that's the concept. Um, so, um, we uh, also heard from counties, uh, mostly in the southeastern part of the state, but also in Violet County, for example, if you've ever been to Manaqua, you'll know what I'm talking about, um, where you have highly developed areas. And um, you might have some infill that you want to do in that highly developed area, and uh, those already have high percentage of impervious surface already, and is it fair to hold somebody kind of in an infill type of, of situation to a very limited amount of impervious surface when everybody around you, um, you know, it doesn't really fit the development around you. So we have um, introduced the concept of a highly developed shoreline. And so uh, what that is, is the current standard in, in the 2010 revisions was up to 15% of impervious surface. And again, this is, again, for lots within 300 feet, um, because the revisions haven't taken place yet. So, um, but it will be just for repairing lots or lots fully within 300 feet if the revisions go through. Um, so you have, um, without a permit, you only have to go to 15, you can go to 15% impervious surface. The reason for that is we have studies, about 12, 14 studies, that say that uh, when you hit about 12 to 15 percent of impervious surface in a watershed, you start adversely impacting water quality in the receiving water. And so that's where we picked it, didn't just come out of the air. And so uh, the 15 percent um, uh, uh, was there. And if you want to go to um, higher than that, you need a permit from the county. And the maximum you can go is 30%. And if you want to go higher than 30%, you need a variance. You need to be able to show that you do not use the use of your property unless you will with 30% of the service. So that's the current standard on the 2010 rules. We are talking about a highly developed shoreline concept. And there, for um, residential land use, you can go to 30% instead of the 15%. No permit, and you go to 40 percent of the previous surface with a permit, and then beyond 40 percent, you need a variance. And we use data. We ask counties for data as far as where they're, you know, they're in these types of developments, how much impervious surface they have. And unfortunately, the only data the county that can provide us is the Walker job. That's the county we used. <laughs> so uh, we were, you know, we were looking for data to set these limits, but that's where they came from. In the vast majority of residential, I think something like 90 percent fall under that 40 percent. So we're not, you know, that's why we set the limit where it was. And again, I just wanted to point out we just need to pick the numbers out of the air and use uh, data and science to, to pick them. Um, so um, and so you would need um, you would need uh, to do some mitigation with the permit to um, to mitigate to go up to 40, 30, 40 percent, just like with the uh, the current standard. So um, we also looked at, and, and the way we defined highly developed area was uh, we used ur uh, census blocks. And uh, the Census Bureau says that a, an area is an urbanized area if you have um, a, develop a density in the census block of over 500 people per square mile, and um, the whole the, the contiguous area of census blocks is over 50,000. So um, all of those areas are called urbanized areas, and there's these little heap of things all over the state. Most of you know, Milwaukee, as you can imagine, it goes out communities around it. Um, um, so Wigan, I don't think Manitowoc is an urbanized area, but um, uh, you may not get over 30, over 50,000, which you might. Um, the, um, but then we said, this isn't going to work for everybody, because it leaves people up like Monaco, because they don't have the 50,000 um, uh, threshold. So uh, we said, okay, then we'll go to, we'll add commercial, industrial, and business zoning to that urbanized area concept. So we added that, and, um, and so in those areas, we got commercial and industrial, we get, we provide an even more flexibility. And you can go without a permit all the way up to 40%. So residential is, in, in the highly developed area, is 30%, commercial is 40%. And with a permit of mitigation, you go all the way up to 60%. So we're trying to recognize the needs for commercial use, 
business uses. You're going to need a parking lot, for example. <laughs> and, and so, um, and the mitigation we're talking about is very similar to what I talked about um, uh, with, with um, not even having to include it in your present. You have a bioswale, you have a rain garden, you have some mechanism to capture the runoff from the parking lot or the roof or whatever and infiltrate it rather than allow it to go into receiving water. So, um, non conforming structures. There's a couple pictures of non conforming structures in there. Um, the setback, which has been in place since the 1960s, is 75 feet. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, but we have a lot of buildings that have been built closer than, 30, uh, than 75 feet. And um, so we have, we also have a 35 foot zone that we would like, that, that's sort of our most critical zone. What we're trying to do there is provide for natural habitat as well as a buffer zone for water that's in the water bottle. Uh, and so you've got your 35 foot zone, then you have between 35 and 75 feet and then you have 75 feet. So we're looking at three different zones here from the ordinary high water mark. And um, so uh, what we, we have in the current 2010 rule is that if you're within 35 feet, um, you can repair and maintain that structure within the building. So um, you, take, you take the building, you visually take saran wrap and cover it up, and that's your building envelope. It's not the footprint, it's the building envelope. And you can do pretty much anything that you need to do in there to repair and maintain that structure. So if you want to expand it, however, now you're, you're, in, now you're moving it back, unless there's some reason that you can't do it. It's a big for So, um, so that's, that's the concept there. Uh, but between 35 and 75, we heard from the counties that say, look, we, you need to be able to do a little bit of expansion. Somebody might want to add a bedroom or a bathroom or something, and, and, and you're, you're limiting folks too much. So we said, OK, uh, what have you done? We looked at some counties that have ordinances already that allow for limited expansion between 35 and 75 feet. And um, uh, that would be from where the front of your house is. Um, and uh, so we are allowing lateral expansion uh, up to 200 square feet based on that, uh, what the companies have been allowing. And, um, and so you can still do vertical expansion if you're back there as well, up to 35 feet high. So basically, if you, if you have a one story, you can add another story, you can add a 200 square foot lateral. Now, if the back of your house <laughs> extends back beyond 75 feet, you can expand back there all year. But this is for houses that, say, they started at 40 feet, and they ended at 60 feet, we're sort of landlocked there by the, by the so we're allowing some expansion. Um, we're also um, discontinuing, we're, we're illuminating some language as a sort of a technical amendment that will bring it into performance with the statute regarding non conforming and, um, and um, you have non conforming structures and you have non conforming uses. And really, the statute only addresses uses and structures, and so we're, we're, we're coming into line with that. Yeah, the question about that, I'll answer it, but um, I won't go into that in too, too much detail right now. We're also eliminating the requirement to remove non-conforming accessory structures as part of mitigation. So if you got an accessory structure out there, um, you can um, keep it. Um, and uh, we're also clarifying that um, we had a provision about what about boat houses in there, really wet boat houses. This is houses that boat houses that are out grandfathered in that are out beyond the ordinary high watermark that is regulated by the state, not the county, and so we're just clarifying that. So one other point I want to make before I go any further about um, water curvy services. Everyone gets to keep what they have. So everything is grandfathered in as far as the curvy services. So the 15%, the 30%, the 40%, all of those different things is for new development. It's not for existing development. I want to make that real clear. So if somebody has 80% impervious surface right now, they can keep it. They can maintain it. They can move it. They can put something else there that's impervious. They got a tennis court. They want to build a barn. They can do that. They want to, um, they want to take part of their uh, uh, patio up and, and actually expand. They can do that because that's impervious.
these surface already there. So, um, so we, there's a lot of flexibility already in that in these surfaces. And that's something that I don't think is clear to everyone. And that's in the 2010 report. So some other proposed changes in Charlotte zoning, vegetative management. Um, there's a provision that allows counties to um, uh, allow removal of invasive, damaged, uh, dangerous, um, and dangerous would include things like poison ivy, would include like a windblown limb that might fall. <laughs> um, uh, anything that proposes a safety hazard. The requirement is that you have to replant something there. If you take it out, something out something native um, and the rule actually has a note in it that tells you where you can go on the website to find what native species uh, you can plant. So um, we're clarifying that no permit is needed. Actually that rectifies an escape from the 2010 rule. We forgot to remove three words under the permit. So we're removing those words. So, so that's the vegetative management piece. The reporting standards, we're just eliminating the reporting standard for our counties. They don't have to tell us when they have uh, issued a permit on a non structure. So, um, so next steps. Uh, we've already uh, written these uh, proposed revisions. We've been out to public hearing with them. And then so we've gotten about 410 comments. And of those comments, uh, I think 94 of them were in favor. Um, but 30 or 40 were neutral and the rest were opposed, so, but, which is typical because more people come out in opposition to things than they do in favor. Um, and uh, of, the, of the ones that were opposed, about almost uh, 250 said that they don't want to do the revisions, that they should go back to the 2010, that these revisions are too loose, that they provide too much flexibility. The uh, other one said these are too, still too restrictive. So, uh, we had about 30 some that said they were too restrictive, and we had like a That was more of a postcard campaign than a of organizations. So, but we have to follow So, anyway, so we're evaluating the comments. We're, we'll post a summary of the comments that we, see, we received. Um, we'll either go ahead with the revisions, or we'll make, in fact, we will make some changes uh, based on some of the comments that we received. Um, for example, one of the changes that we will do is on that 200 foot expansion, the uh, original revision said you can do that one time. Some counties said, well, what if they only want to do 100 now and 100 later? So we said, okay. <laughs> um, so that's one provision that we'll make and actually we're going to give the counties an option. Because some counties will say, we don't want to keep track of it. They do it once, they do 150, that's all they, that's all they get. And other counties will, are willing to do that with it and they'll uh, multiple expansions to a maximum of 200. So um, that's one comment, for example, that we will incorporate. Um, we will um, revise the real language as appropriate. We have to go back to our Natural Resources Board and plan to do that in December. And uh, so they would approve a final, if they approve a final rule package, that then goes to the governor for his approval and kind of semi-simultaneously to the legislature, and we'll go to the uh, committee in the Senate, the assembly, uh, and for their review, uh, we'll also go to the Joint Committee on Rules, JCRAR, for their review, and uh, finally, if we get through all of that, um, that it will uh, eventually get published, we hope, um, in time for um, probably next spring sometime, April, May. So, um, before I get into my next part of the presentation on what limits, are there any questions on Sean or Or if you think one way to go? reference to the previous slide, sir, about the uh, high water mark. Mm -hmm. The uh, ordinary high water mark. Ordinary high water mark. What is the, the definition of ordinary, for instance, you know, Lake Michigan has kind of seen a, a recession of the shoreline. What is the, I guess, rule of thumb or what determines the ordinary high water? Basically, we look at, um, and, and often it is a mark. Uh, you can see where there is a mark where the, where the vegetation changes from terrestrial vegetation to aquatic vegetation, where a lot of times on a rock, that, you know, or a series of rocks along the shore, you would be able to see a line. 
um, at, at an elevation where the, the water has, has risen in common heat. Um, it's, it's somewhat of an art um, looking at it, but um, uh, we determine an elevation of an ordinary high water mark uh, for all the lakes and rivers and Lake Michigan for that matter. And um, uh, while Lake Michigan has uh, seen some lower water levels uh, the last several years, um, it's, you know, for a lake like Lake Michigan, we're looking at a longer term trend before we change the And it isn't just us doing it, we have to be the Corps of Engineers waiting on that as well. Because that's on the national So, so uh, in our lakes, we kind of do an and we, we hopefully, come, most often, we do agree with the company staff uh, as to what it is, not always. So it is a partnership between yourselves, the Corps of Engineers, and the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm Lake Michigan, for sure. So. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about wetland legislation um, and changes to wetlands uh, legislation. This is probably, uh, for those of you in the development area, has been maybe one of the uh, areas where we've had the most disagreement, I guess, or discussion between the department and people that want to develop the property is, is wetlands. Where are the wetlands? What constitutes the wetlands? Where are they delineated? What can you do in them? What can't you do? And so um, we had, um, previous to this wetland legislation, which passed last year, last summer, um, we, uh, that, no, I'm sorry, summer of 2012, July 1st, actually, um, we had, um, some limitations in our administrative code as far as what we could do with mitigation and uh, what we could do with general permits and what we could do with general permits. And that um, did a couple things. One, it, it somewhat tied our hands and, uh, as far as being able to look at, say, a net environmental benefit of a project and, um, and to look at options within, within a project to try to problem solve with the developer to come up with a win-win situation. Um, and, uh, and, so, uh, and, and so that was kind of the, one of the, the main things that it did. Um, and also, we, it didn't allow us to do general permits. And uh, general permits, while they are every bit as protective and the requirements are can be every bit as uh, stringent, if you will, as an individual permit, uh, they're much easier process-wise. They recognize that there are commonalities between projects and that those can fit into a general permit situation. But we had limitations as to the types of general permits we could do for wetlands. And also we had to do them all by administrative rule. And so that meant that they were the only types of permits that the, the Chapter 30, which is our wetland regulation, or our, our, our in-water regulations and our wetlands, were the only ones where we had to do general permits by administrative rule. Every other, we, we just use an administrative process. That doesn't mean that we didn't have a public process, because we do for all of our general permits. We write them, we take them out to the public, we get comments, we change them. People have the ability to challenge them if they wish, um, similar to administrative rule. But administrative rule has a lot more process involved. And it takes um, uh, a, a traditional general permit we can do in maybe six months. Um, with, with a public hearing and with a public process, uh, and this sort of rule on the current process is probably a four to five year uh, journey. So uh, it didn't allow us to be very nimble, if you will, uh, as an agency. So um, uh, in 2012, the legislature and governor were kind enough to provide us some better tools uh, to allow us to work with uh, developers and the public to, um, to address wetland issues. And so uh, that was Wisconsin Act 118, effective July 1st. And um, what it did, it, it required a, a group of uh, general permits uh, to be done. We have issued six general permits since then for um, common project categories, including commercial, residential, industrial, local roads, utilities, and recreational. So we have those out there and in place, and if you qualify for a general permit, 
um, it's, a, it's a much easier process. You probably get approval in a matter of weeks, even days in some cases. Um, and um, so uh, in the first year, from 2000, July 1st to 2012 to um, June 30th, 2013, we had 298 projects that qualified for general permits. And like, not all of those general permits were automatically effective. I mean, these are ones that we've been working on, and some of them were, might have only been effective for a few months in that year period. But, um, and um, that provides that streamlined regulatory review with no requirement for mitigation. Uh, for any sort of wetland fill. And um, that's about 63% of all the permit applications. Prior to that, we were issuing general permits for a little under 40%. Our goal is to hit 80% of general permits. So we're, we're moving toward it. Um, and uh, we, we fully um, expect to utilize that. Um, so uh, we have, um, uh, we have and we continue to expand the ability of people general permits in a more streamlined, straightforward manner. Um, it also allowed us um, uh, to ch change kind of the review for individual permits, or IPs as we call them. And we, we developed guidance and conducted training for staff to explain the new process. Um, it requires a pre-application meeting, which I think is invaluable for us to kind of get together to sort of identify what are some of the issues up front, so that you, uh, a developer isn't going into this huge planning process and then you pull the rug out and come under them at the 11th hour. Um, we're, we're working and problem solving together um, up front. And, um, and so I think that has helped a lot. Uh, there is a public notice during the permit review. Uh, it also allows us some flexibility to limit the search for what we call the alternatives analysis, the practical alternatives analysis. Uh, that was always a nightmare for us as well, as a matter of fact. Let me give you an example. This happened to occur in Green Bay, and there's actually some legislation involved that I was involved with this decision. Um, and um, the Green Bay Packers wanted to, um, um, basically they have this concept, they're still pursuing it, I think, and it's, and it's uh, in a pattern after other, other venues, but most notably the England Patriots have this concept, where they have sort of, uh, this is a sports uh, destination as opposed to just Lambo fuel, which is a good enough destination in itself. But they want to provide um, little league baseball and soccer, and, and you know, it's a, sp a sports destination. And as part of that, they, they want some commercial ventures. And initially, they started out, they had a, a, a right on kind of a corner. Uh, I explained it as sort of like um, a, um, a mall on steroids. Um, so you, you would have uh, Lambo Field on one side, and then out on Highway 41, um, they were going to put a Bass Pro Shop. And there was some wetlands issues. They had a 14-acre site, 11 of them was already filled, but they had a bunch of wetlands. And we had um, uh, a negotiated, and again, we were taking the approach of a um, uh, of a net environmental benefit. And this is what we got. First of all, they wanted to fill initially about three acres of wetlands. Uh, on the avoid and minimize type of approach that some of you have, we got that reduced to about an acre and a half. Uh, we got them to agree the wetland that was there that we were going to fill portion of was quickly becoming, um, instead of native um, species, full of Phragmites and full of buckthorn. And actually today, it's um, full of Phragmites and buckthorn. And so uh, what they agreed to do is that they would maintain that, that what was left of that wetland in the actual, they would, they would actively manage the Phragmites, manage the buckthorn, make sure that they had made a plantings there. There was also, they avoided completely a very rare forested wetland on the south side of that, or actually I guess on the west side of that. And um, they were going to put a conservation easement on that. In addition, they were going to um, give us four acres of mitigation for that one and a half acre. As I looked at that project, I thought, this is a win-win. They get their development, we get maintenance of our of, of the wetland that's there, we get conservation easement on this rare wetland, so that's maintained in perpetuity. 
Um, and we get four acres of mitigation. They also did, we're doing some stuff on stormwater, put it underground, and it's close to us from travel fields, and there's some concerns about that, and we're going to do that as well. We're much greater expense. Much greater, they're going to put a two-story parking lot instead of the traditional all the time. We, we had, I thought, a really good deal. And so we issued the permit, and um, one, and we got sued for it, which is why we got legislation. And, um, and one of the things they were suing on is we didn't look at all the practical alternatives. And one of the practical alternatives that the people bringing suit were saying we should have looked at was they should have put this thing two exits up. Well, I mean, that doesn't fit the business model. They needed that there as part of the anchor for their you know, major sports complex hall idea. It wouldn't work, two exits up. <laughs> so um, the, the, the law allows us to limit the practical alternatives now to just adjacent areas. So when we have this type of situation, we can consider business models and business needs along with um, uh, other things. And it also allows us to do mitigation um, where before we were limited to this type of mitigation we could use. Uh, and get really a net, for this particular problem, we have a net environmental, a net increase in wetland um, rather than a decrease. So, um, so Bass Pro Shop ended up pulling out everything that, as you know, Cabell was in. So I uh, the same kind of deal. So uh, we, we, we didn't work this out. So, um, so as far as mitigation, again, it's now required for all individual permits to offset the impacts. So uh, this gives us really opportunity as far as if we're coming at it from DNR, from the approach that we're water quality, we're trying to increase our wetlands, we're trying to reverse the loss, if you will. Um, but we want to allow, and problem solving and allow development in areas that this gives us a tool to be able to do that, to be able to come up with some solutions um, on an individual property. Um, and so you can buy a bank credit. Uh, one of the problems is since we weren't doing much mitigation, we didn't have any banks. So we have added four banks, and we're actively pursuing more uh, to provide additional bank credits. Um, and or you could do mitigation with the private uh, site. Maybe you know if you had to put your building here, but you could restore a wetland over here. Um, you can do that. Uh, that works. Uh, and we can establish an in-lieu fee program. Basically, that what that would be is you would pay. Say you're going to um, fill an acre, right? And ratio is one and a half to one. So you have to mitigate for one and a half acres and it's going for this round number is 20,000 an acre. Yeah. Mitigation acres. Um, so, um, and actually it's probably on the low side. So actually what you need is $30,000 is what it would cost you to buy an acre and a half on the mitigation bank. Instead of having to find a bank or say like we're out right now, we're short on bank acres, you could pay that to the department essentially. Uh, we would hold it in escrow or maybe through the National Resources Foundation. We've been looking at a, a variety of things. And we would use that money to develop, a, to restore a weapon somewhere in the, in the area. And so uh, that allows you to get your mitigation responsibilities done and move your project forward rather than have to sit and wait for a bank to get it done. So, yes, question. Question. You said that you pay pay and go out of the right. DNR. It then, is that money then held set aside specifically for purchase of land, or could that be yes. paid to buy up for other? No, years? no. It is specifically for that. And that's written in the law. Yes. Okay. And one of the things that we had to get Corps of Engineers approval for this, and so the Corps of Engineers we're going to have to the state is going to have to develop it. Uh, in fact, we have um, we have um, submitted our. Um, our final prospectus to the Corps in August about how we would work together with them. And um, we expect to add this option in 2014. That's been the whole of why we're not doing it already because we had to get core engineers approved. Because they need mitigation as you as you know. So um, and as you also will know things are a little bit on hold with the core right now. So we're not expecting, we, we had hoped maybe to have a response in October, and probably would not happen now, depending on the federal government. So, um, uh, so that's, but that's what, what we still expect to add the option in 2020. So, 
Uh, and more details in a couple once we get, get all the details. Yes. Um, could you explain a little bit the, what needs to be done on the on-site mitigation? Uh, you have to have a biologist or a, a plant expert that needs to view the site every year for like five years. Is that, is that correct? Um, that would be, that could be one of the, it depends on what it is. It's really case specific. If you're creating a wetland from whole cloth, if you will, that might be the case. If you're just, if you've got maybe a degraded wetland that you're improving and you're restoring that uh, back to more native, um, it may not take that much. So it, it's very case specific. Okay, any more questions on uh, wetlands before, or at the end? All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about brownfields, especially here in Mantua, because uh, there's been some real successful projects here. One thing I will emphasize, and one of the reasons I talked about the water division, is you notice that I didn't mention brownfields as one of the programs in the water division. And that isn't, although in uh, uh, one of my, my first jobs with the state, was with the Department of Administration, and I was in the budget office there. And one of the policy things that I worked on uh, was brown, developing the brownfields legislation. So I do know a little bit about it, but I haven't been steeped in brownfields for 20 odd years. So um, these slides are from our brownfields folks, and um, I know enough to be dangerous. But if you have some questions, take it down in the leaves. I may have to write them down and, and get back to you uh, because I don't want to use the right. Um, at any rate, brownfields are essentially abandoned or underused sites um, that um, there, you know, there's perceived contamination. Who knows what occurred? You know, that you've got a, a site that was an industrial manufacturing fog, you know, in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. It's been abandoned since 1968, and who knows what's occurred there um, uh, back then. And so. Um, and one of the reasons that it's not been developed is people are worried about the liability they'd be getting into if they um, undertook and bought the property. So, um, so we developed the Brownfield program to try to address that concern. So, um, um, uh, and essentially what it is, is um, uh, a liability um, limitation. Um, uh, yep, for someone that's willing to uh, buy and develop in an infill area that, that is a brownfield. We estimate there's about 6,000 of them in the state. They're both in urban and rural communities. Um, and um, there's been a few more vacant industrial properties due to the recent recession. But Mantua has been a leader in dealing with these sites. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk about it today, even though I'm not the, uh, the best expert. Um, so Mandela has been very successful in bringing brownfields grants for the city and its businesses. So um, um, they brought in, uh, we brought in over a million dollars of state money and a um, million and a half dollars of federal money uh, into the community to clean up these sites. Uh, essentially what it is is we provide grants to the state and federal government to help uh, someone that's interested in buying and developing a brownfield site to clean it up. Once you clean it up, we issue basically an identification so that you're, you're going to say you're good to go. If there's another, if there's more cleanup that's found later that's necessary, then you know, we're going to accept the responsibility. So, um, so there's been, um, and I've got a lot of examples of, of brownfield sites. Um, uh, this one is uh, uh, Miro, and um, it's. Uh, we're doing asbestos abatement on this, um, and I think there's plans to take the building down and, and start the redevelopment. Uh, but um, I mean, there's some pictures to show why people are reluctant to buy them. <laughs> um, uh, some of those sites are pretty messy inside. We have the former Rockwell Line um, site, uh, where um, and that's in our voluntary party liability exemption. We call it the VPLE process. Um, the buildings have been basically demolished and cleared. Um, and uh, uh, again, like I said, any individual or business or unit of government for that matter that can take, conduct an environmental investigation and clean up the contaminated property uh, with, with some oversight from, from the state can receive this exemption in future environmental uh, liability. 
and um, that isn't that isn't an exemption of liability from your own process that you're starting up. <laughs> Some accident occurs, but it is from anything that happened previous. So, um, and here we've got um, and the uh, brownfield through the office building from the manufacturing facility, um, and uh, I mean, there's an example of what can what can be achieved there um, from that, and so. Um, uh, that's a real, I mean, there's, there's success story after success story. Um, and, uh, uh, this, this particular site had all sorts of different activities on it and um, uh, was an implement manufacturer, currently chromium uh, and tannery operation. So um, um, a lot of um, things. But that's, um, I just wanted to bring up um, Brownfields as something that Mantuac has taken a good advantage of. And, so I think it's a it's a good win-win um, program. Uh, we uh, provide technical assistance and some funding, and uh, and you get the thing cleaned up, and then we, we offer the, that exemption of liability going down the road, and uh, you can um, not have to worry about the risk from what happened before, and uh, get out of the business. So. Um, with that, um, I think I've got a few minutes left for questions. And um, I like to see the brownfields effect that um, a lot of the brownfields uh, liabilities that you put into effect is, is for someone buying that land. Well, let's say you have a current owner who owns land. There used to be a dry cleaning facility. So, yeah, he never was a dry cleaner. He never had anything to do with the business, but he had to buy it up after that business left. Well, there's no way for that person to get involved in that program currently. Can the regulations be changed to allow those people in too? So you don't have to sell your land in order to get this land decontaminated, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. So now you are only open it up to people who are buying the land, but now you open it up to even a larger span of people who maybe want to put some sort of commercial development in. They don't have to sell their land, even though, and they weren't the original contaminators. I guess. What is the issue holding that up, and why can't that be put into the law as well? Now you're in the weeds beyond which I can okay. answer your question, but I, uh, I certainly, um, just from my own viewpoint, would say that um, I would agree that that's probably something that probably should be um, looked at, and it might be a factor. Um, the department, uh, contrary to previous administrations, where we took a more active role in advancing ideas and legislation, really has taken the position that, and I'm not certainly criticizing it at all, I think we're more comfortable with this position, actually, um, that the executive branch, um, at least the agencies in the executive branch, um, our job is to administer and implement legislation passed by the legislature signed by the governor. It is not our responsibility, nor our, um, our place, if you will, to say, here's a policy that should be changed, unless we're asked. So what I would recommend is you contact one of your legislative offices to talk to them about this kind of policy. And um, most frequently, that office will eventually call us and say, what do you guys think about this? And you know, we'll have some dialogue there. Um, I think that's certainly something that we should look at to make sure that if you can establish that they say you have a current owner that didn't go into the Brownfields program you know, up front, um, and they, but they did not do anything. But well, we want to make sure they didn't do anything to cause that contamination. Right. And, um, and so if we can show that they're not a responsible party, part of this is to um, promote that and, and to get them into the Brownfields. And uh, I don't know enough about it if there were some barriers. Maybe on the federal side. Actually, uh, Sarabja came in and talked to me as walking general of our field, and we asked that specific question. Mm -hmm. Unless you sell it and someone else buys it, you can get a program there. And that's what's at the moment, definitely no. Mm -hmm. But that would seem like a that's uh, common sense piece. Yeah, it does. It does. Oh. But we'll, you know, <laughs> there, there may be some underlying thing that needs Any other questions? 
Uh, question on your BPLE. Uh, yes. Are you involved in that at all? Is this a couple, a couple questions on that? Um, no, I'm not, but I certainly will. Are you aware of any, any changes to the program or funding related to the BPLE? Uh, not, 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 nothing is pending. It's, it's a great program, is I guess my point. Uh, one thing I think that we'd be well served if lenders got a little bit more information about it. It's a great hedge against exploiter for lenders and anybody has a problem field. It's a really good Wisconsin program or Wisconsin specific program. And if there was a push to get the lender lenders out there to understand a little bit better, I think uh, it would help with smooth, it, smooth that smooth yeah. that out but also help with development. Essentially it's an insurance policy. Yeah. That if you get a closure letter that if anything subsequently found the owner will step in essentially with an insurance policy and fix it. So the lender would be on the hook after the fact. So again, I mean, it's that simple. But if that the message can get out, I think there'll be a lot of funding available. And maybe there's, and I'll have to check with our ground this program as opposed to what they've done. I know Darcy Fawcett has said that we've done a great job for outreach, but maybe this is one area where we can do a little better. Any other questions or comments that uh, we want Mr. Rasmussen to take back? All right, well, thank you very much. A round of applause. We've briefed, but uh, Mr. Brad Boyce has done us the briefing. He's been discussing the homeowners again. Thanks. A couple comments related to the Great. Thanks again. I will be brief. Uh, Russ, when, when Barry asked me, he said, well, I'm kind of more of a com color commentary here today. So just wanted to touch on a few things. Uh, Russ made mention of you know kind of the new DNR and, and the new way that they're going about their business, and I think that's one thing that I definitely want to uh, concentrate on. I think you know him and, and Secretary Steph and Deputy Secretary Maroney and, and Governor Walker. Really, it's you know on a lobbying side, we've never asked for the answer to always be yes. We realize that there's going to be times when people apply and they make their best effort, and sometimes the answer is no. We've always argued for predictability in the process and the ability to have a conversation that, you know, the answer sometimes is yeah, it is no on the beginning, but if you make these changes, we can get to a yes. And that's one thing that we had argued was lacking in the past was it was a no answer and not a lot of guidance on how to get to a yes in the future. And we definitely have that now uh, with this new uh, Department of Natural Resources. One good example from this area in particular uh, I think it was earlier in the summer, there was some issues with wetland mapping, and there was some land that was owned and things that changed, maps that changed. Uh, we got a couple of calls in the office, it was a, you know, strange thing seems to happen sometimes after 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, the calls that you get, they always seem to come in at that time. Uh, but there were some definite problems of land that didn't have wetlands in it, that now had wetlands, and there was a big problem. There was you know, sales on the line and lot sales that were in danger of going south. And really, I think within a week of that happening, there was face-to-face -face meetings between our members, DNR staff, and there was answers to the questions that helped resolve the problem. And that just, frankly, simply didn't happen in years past. So I just want to make sure that that's mentioned, that uh, that's a huge, huge improvement from the way things were done in the past. Uh, and wanted to mention that here today. Both of the issues that Russ mentioned, NR 115, uh, Wisconsin Builder Association are supportive of those changes. Um, we, I think, mentioned 94 comments or so in favor of those. I think probably about a quarter of those were from our members. Uh, we asked them to reach out to the department and say that they supported those. The challenge in this moving forward is, I think, going to be possibly some people in the legislature that want to go even further on those changes. And certainly, there might be places where we could pick and choose that we would say we would like to go further as well. But we think the department has struck a pretty good balance on the public policy of those rule revisions on a very important issue that we're supportive of the efforts. The sooner they get through the legislative process, the better, and we'll continue to advocate uh, on that regard as well. And then finally, on the wetlands uh, revisions that were done, I mean, that was a huge, took a long time. There was a lot of people brought together on that issue. Senator Kedzie was the lead. Representative Mursaw in the State Assembly. Both those gentlemen and their staff spent a, t a lot of time uh, talking about that issue. We supported it, the realtors, a number of aid groups, and I think, again, uh, a balanced approach that gives more options moving forward to make sure the projects don't get shut down uh, and can move forward in the state. So, um, again, uh, that was a highlight of our legislative session uh, last year. And, uh, and just to conclude very quickly, um, on NR-115, once hopefully that moves through, and on the wetlands issue, I mean, obviously, we advocated for, the department thinks, I think, 
this is good public policy, but no bill or rule change is ever perfect. Uh, so on the wetlands, once we continue, we're a year you know, plus into the law change, some of these things are still coming online. I mean, you as the end users are gonna be the ones that are gonna determine whether these are good programs, successful programs, and there's probably gonna be tweaks. I mean, it seems like you know, every two or three sessions we do a wetland revision, and that probably is not gonna change. So as you use these, these and, and the same thing with NR115, Make sure you keep track of the good and bad because that's really the only way legislators are going to figure out and, and department staff if these are working as intended or not and there's always uh, hiccups along the way. So that's just one uh, plug that I put out there as well. So thanks again for having me and, and Russ for the, for the update. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Thank you.